offering. Father, we come to the name of Jesus, and I thank you, Lord, for um, this offering. I thank you, Lord, that we can give with a glad heart, and we give on purpose. Thank you, Father God, that you've promised us that you would supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory. So, Father, we give by faith. We give because we love you, and we sow seed, and we return tithes, and it frees you, Lord God, to be our our unlimited source of whatever we need, and I thank you for it. And now, Lord, I thank you for the, for the seed of the word. The seed of the word will get into our heart, Lord God, and, and may we be humble and, and diligent to hear what the word is saying and then also to do it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. So tonight we're going to talk about your true identity in God's eyes. You know, the people of the world, they will see people in their own eyes and in their own ways, but you know God, he sees us in a different way, amen? He's, he looks into the heart of the man or the heart of the woman, and so if you're not careful, even a believer, the world will put you down, put you in a box, and they'll label you, and they'll just uh, um, squeeze, squeeze the life out of you, suck the air out of the room if, if you let them, right? And so we all we have to be conscious of the fact that God sees us in a totally different way. Many, many times in the Old Testament, God changed the names of people. And he did it because names are very significant, especially in the Old Testament. They meant something. It was a way that God would call things that are not as though they were. He, w- he would take people and just completely change their name and, and in doing so change their identity. And when God speaks it, you know it's coming about. And so it still happens today. God, we go through the word and through the spirit and, and God changes our name and who we are in Christ. Amen. And what we say about ourselves. So it's very important what you say about yourself. And uh, don't let the world put you down or put you in a box. And so there are names given by humans and there are names given by God. The name given by God is a name that will lead us to God's promises God changed Abram's name to Abraham, Sarah, Sarai to Sarah, Jacob to Israel, and then, of course, Simon to Peter. These are just some of the few that we're going to talk about. And through those names, what God gave was new beginnings, new hopes, and new blessings. You know, and I thought, as I was doing this message, I thought about King David. Remember how he got anointed to be king? In uh, 1 Samuel 16, God told God told Samuel to go down to the household of Jesse and anoint one of his sons. He's going to be the next king of Israel. So so, um, Samuel goes down, and and Jesse lines up all his sons, and first son he comes to is is Eliab. And that guy was a fine-looking dude, fine specimen. He was tall. He was handsome. He looked like a king. And and Samuel was like, I found him. And the Lord said, no, 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 it's not him. He said, Samuel, you're looking, you're looking at the outward appearance. God said, I look at the heart of a man or the heart of a woman. And then, of course, when David came, God said, that's your king. And so a little shepherd boy, David, Samuel seen him as a little shepherd boy. But you know what God saw him as? A king. Amen. Is it more important what God says about us or what the world says about us? What God says. Amen. Because God, God doesn't lie. So if he says it about us, he, he's, uh, he's on point all the time. Now, I remember when God called me to be a pastor. Um, didn't feel like a pastor on the outside for a while. Because it was, it was just, just something new. It wasn't something that I ever saw myself doing. Wasn't, I didn't really like to speak in front of people. But inside, in my spirit, I knew that I knew that I was a pastor. Because that's what God called me. That's what God um, birthed into my spirit. And so when God does that to you, it'll change your life. You, you'll truly be one of these people that says, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm only moved by what God's word says or what God says about me. And so you grow in those things too. You just grow in it. So names have meaning because they reveal our true identity in God's eyes. And so if you have your Bibles, you want to follow along, turn to Genesis 17. And we're going to see where God changed Abram's name to Abraham. He changed Sarai's name to Sarah. And so that's Genesis uh, 17. 
Now, Sarai, now she's, she's approaching 90 years of age here when God changed their name. I like it. I think God likes it when the odds are stacked against him. I think he really does. He doesn't sweat it out too much. He's God, right? I mean, he don't care if it's a billion to one odds. God will do it if he says he's going to do it. And so, so Sarai means my princess, but God changed her name to Sarah, which means mother of nations. So that means she was going to have a, a son, and she's 90 years of age, or she's going to be 90 years of age, and she was barren her whole life. She never could have children in that way, but God was going to do a miracle. And then he changed Abram. His name means exalted father to Abraham, which means father of multitudes. Now that whole journey from when God first came to Abr Abram and, and Sarai and said that you're going to have a son, the whole journey that it, that it was until Isaac came was 25 years. 25 year journey. But when God changed their name, it only took a year after that. See, something special happens. And so that means you got to watch what you call yourself. Some people are hard on themselves and they say, I'm so dumb. I'm so stupid. I can't get anything right. Well, you're not going to get very far doing that, are you? Amen. That's not how God sees you. God sees you as wonder, wonderfully and fearfully made. God has plans for all of your lives. And so say what God says about you. But let's read about this in Genesis 17. It says, so when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And now when, when this is New King James, but I have to stop there every time I read this. When God said, I want you to be blameless, was he saying that I want you to go out and never make a mistake in your life? Well, we know he didn't do that. And we know no one could do that. One person did that. That was Jesus, right? When he said blameless, what he's saying is, I want you to not have any gods before me. I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. I want you to honor me. Have no gods in your life. No gods over me. That's what blameless is. And Abraham held up to that end of the bargain, didn't he? And so look at verse 2. He says, and I will make a covenant between me and you, and, we, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. There God puts the promise out, doesn't he? How old is he? Ninety-nine. How long have they been waiting? Twenty-four years. How old is his wife? 90 by the time she has the baby and physically could never have a baby and God says I'm going to make a covenant with you and you you're going to be the father of many nations that's our God we're to be bold just like that you know what I mean and I start talking about when God called me to be a pastor when he speaks it into your heart and the Holy Spirit will bear witness with you nobody can take that from you nobody you know, there, uh, rarely, rarely will I ever go up to somebody and say, hey, God called you to do this or God wants you to do this or that. I won't do that. You know why? It's better if they hear it from God. Amen. Because when God tells them, it's a lot more powerful than if I tell them. Because <laughs> if I tell them and times get tough, they might quit. But if God tells them, it's, it's the anchor of, of everything that he called them to do is that initial calling of, of what, he's, what he's identified you as in, in your gifting and callings for him. And so, but God's like, hey, you're the, you're the father of many nations. But look at this, verse 5. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I have made you now. It didn't happen physically yet but i am making you that now he said no longer are you abram didn't he say that no longer i don't see you as abram you shouldn't see yourself as abram either you should see yourself as abraham 
the father of many nations. Now remember, in biblical times, names meant everything. If you had a name, people knew what the name meant and what went with that. And so it was a very, very powerful statement. And so look at verse 6. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And we know that happened. We know that God fulfilled that promise. Now look down at verse 15. Then God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you, get this now, this is New King James, your version probably says something similar, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. You will not call her Sarai, the old name. Do you get that? He's saying, I'm on the scene. I made a covenant with you from now on. She's Sarah, the mother of nations, right? And so he was pretty, pretty direct with that. And verse 16 says, and I will bless her and also give you a son by her. And then I will, I, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. And so that's how it all started. Now, when God said that she'll be mother of nations and you'll be the father of nations and kings will come from you, we have to understand that when God calls us and he changes our name or changes our identity or tells us our purpose in life, without a purpose, the people perish. We got to get hooked up with God and find out what, he, what it is he wants us to do. What did he gift us to do? But when, when, he, when he does that and changes, changes our names like that, it's, it's something that um, not only does it, does it, we only understand parts of it. Because you'll find one thing out about God. His plans and purpose for your life are way bigger than you could ever imagine. Way bigger. Or you could put it this way. His dreams for your life are bigger than your own dreams. But you got to get started. And you got to spend time in prayer. And when you spend time in prayer, understand that the Holy Spirit, the greater one, is within you. So you commune with the Father, you pray, you worship God, and, and, and just, just connect with Him. And the Holy Spirit will continue to bear witness or reassure you or come bring everything alive in you, enhance everything in you. It'll pull the flesh out of the way, and the mind will quiet down, and you'll have a straight pipeline to, to what the Father is saying to you. And you'll find out, like I said, his plans for your life, you don't even have a clue. Amen? It doesn't, God doesn't fail to meet expectation ever. He exceeds expectations. He just goes way above and beyond. In the beginning when you're following God and you heard his voice and you're doing what he said, it might be like walking through a thick, thick brush patch. And maybe you're just walking through, just cutting your way, but eventually you're going to get to the end of the brush patch, and you're going to look up, and there's going to be an open field and a beautiful vision, a beautiful sight. So you have to just hang in there and trust God over what, over what your own self says sometimes. And so let's look at Galatians 3. And so in Abraham and Sarah... God's plan for their life was much bigger, like I said, than what they could even imagine. They just wanted a son. And then God, they wanted a, an heir and someone to carry on a name. But boy, God took it further than that, didn't he? I mean, but I want to show you that, that what, how God blessed them, that we now in the New Testament, we are, we are children of Abraham, or we are by faith, we are, we are connected with Abraham. And so now, we are experiencing the blessings of God through Abraham's faithfulness and through the covenant that God made with him. Now we are in a better covenant. They had no clue on that, but God did. Aren't you glad God's smarter than you? You know what happens when your mind, or I'll speak for myself, or most people's minds, when the mind can't figure out how God is going to do something, it, it, it'll short circuit. And that short circuit will manifest in worry or anxiety or even fear sometimes because your mind is meant to figure things out naturally. But when, when your mind comes up against it and it can't figure it out naturally, that's when you need to renew your mind to what the Word says. 
And you need to renew your mind to what God's told you in your spirit and, and renew it. Re- renew it to the, to the word of God. Amen? You can be natural-minded, the Bible says, or you can be spiritual-minded. It would behoove you to be spiritually minded. Amen? Let's look at Galatians 3, verse 7. Galatians 3, verse 7. So I'm going to show you how we are connected in with the blessing of Abraham. It says, therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. Then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That's how he got into the covenant with God. We believe God too, right? That's how we are, we are tapping into the same blessing as Abraham. And God spoke that clean, clean back from the beginning when he first met with Abraham. And so now look at Genesis 3.16. It says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say unto seeds as of many but as of one, and to your seed, does your Bible have a capital S? It should, capital S, who is Christ. Jesus is the seed that they're talking about here. So the blessing belongs to Abraham and his seed. Well, who is the seed? Jesus, amen? And since we are in Christ, we benefit from the blessing of Abraham and even a better covenant through Jesus Christ. It all started when God said, I'm changing your name. I'm changing it right now. How many big, beautiful ministries are out there today? It started with with maybe two people. And I want to tell you this, too. Everybody's given different ground to plow. Some churches, I believe this church is the ground that God had us plow here, was very hard soil. Very hard soil, very hard ground to plow, but our our people that went before us they were faithful to plow that ground so that you can get a harvest if you're not plowing ground you're not putting any seed in and you're not getting any harvest right all ministries are called uh, basically to the same thing but yet there's variations and that's why we got to be true to who God called us to be and and don't worry about what other people are doing they do what God called them to do we do what he called us to do and so, but do you see that into your seed who is Christ? I don't believe that Abraham and Sarah really understood that whole thing. Do you realize how many sons and daughters are attributed to Abraham and Sarah, spiritual children? Millions upon millions upon millions, not just the nation of Israel, but the Gentile, which is us that came in to the family of God. And so now Jacob, so Abraham had Isaac and then Isaac had Jacob and then Jacob had 12 sons right they became the 12 tribes of Israel and then um, because the families got so big they called them tribes out of the tribe of Judah came Jesus right just like the Bible for so uh, David was from the tribe of Judah and then through Abraham it all started with Isaac right no it really started when God changed their name God changed both of their names. He didn't just change change Abram's name. He changed Sarai's name too. And then from that came came the Savior of the world out of God's chosen race of people. Amen. And so God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Amen. So there was a name change. And so now in the New Testament, Jesus gave Jesus. Simon, the name Cephas, which means stone or rock, which is translated Petros in the Greek and Peter in the English. And so, so Simon, the Hebrew meaning for um, Simon, it means he heard. So the, the, the meaning for the name Simon means he heard or, or you could say it this way, the one who hears the word of God. That's what Simon means. That's what his name means. 
And so when God changed his name to Peter, of course, like I said, it means a stone or a rock. I believe that that represents a transfer, transformation of a person who just not only just hears the word of God, but from that hearing of the word of God, the revelation of who Jesus is comes into their heart and, and, and they're founded on that rock of Jesus Christ. That's why he called him the rock. We're not going to turn there, but in Matthew 16, 18, he says, Thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. A lot of times, people think that Peter is the rock. No. Jesus is the rock. Or in particular, the, the revelation knowledge and the spiritual understanding to 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 perceive and to know and to by faith see Jesus as the Messiah and the Savior of the world, that's given by the Holy Spirit. That's supernatural. That is the, that's the rock or that's the stone. That's the part that will not be, be moved and it's impenetrable. That's, that's what Peter's name got changed to. That's a good deal, isn't it? So remember, when you change names, you're changing meanings and you're changing purpose and you're always from worse to better. <laughs> And so, that's what God's word still does today. There's some people, they'll hear the word, and they'll hear the word, and they'll hear the word, but they don't mix it with faith. They're just taking it as a Bible study. They're just taking it as, as there's no discipline, you know? And so, they pretty much stay stuck where they're at. But when people humble themselves to the word, open their spirit up to what God is saying, it, it penetrates them. Does the Bible say that the word of God becomes grafted into our spirit? But you have to have what? Humility. With humility, his word comes in, and we go through a transformation. We go through a supernatural transformation. The first transformation is the born again part. That, that's, the, that's the main transformation. But then our mind needs to be renewed and transformed, right? To the truth of God's word. And there's a lot of Christians... They don't know what the word says. Amen. And so we got to pray that 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 changes in a lot of people's lives. And so not just hearing the word, but a spiritual revelation knowledge of who Jesus is. That's who you are. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you are the church? Do you believe you're the body of Christ? So what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. So who built freedom in Christ's church? Jesus built it, right? And so, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What's that mean to you? Who, who, whose gates are they? They're the gates of hell, right? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the devil has gates and walls around him as protection. He cannot prevent the church from bombarding his territory and taking back what he stole from you and what he stole from God. We're to be moving forward, not standing in place, right? Now, there are times when you're, when you're fending off the devil and you're standing in faith, but, but what about the times where you're just advancing the kingdom? You can do that every day. Tomorrow's a brand new day because there's all kinds of people out there lost. And if they would die tomorrow, they would go to hell. They belong to the devil. You can break that barrier and you can tell them about the love of God that comes through Jesus Christ. And, and you can break down that wall that Satan has over them or around them. You can break it down. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. You can look at all these people out there that do not know God and do not know Jesus. You can just visualize them walking with these gates around them. And the devil says, they belong to me. They are mine. And you know what? He's right. So you got to go in there and take it from him. Because ultimately, they came from God, right? And when you speak that word, oh my goodness, that word is a gate buster. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And you just, you just speak life into them, and they will, they, that word will get deep down into their spirit. Amen. It's a light. The Bible says it's a light that gets in there and pushes out the darkness. And 
It's not hard to tell people about Jesus. But there's a resistance to it. I understand that. There's a, just a resistance because if the devil is, if he's going to try to stop you to do anything, now he's not going to make you sick or get you in a car accident or something like that. But, but there's just a resistance because it just, there just is because you're, you're, you're about ready to go in enemy territory. So what do you got to do when something's resisting you or, or fear's trying to come in? What do you got to do? Run? Hide? Come ask me to go talk to him? No, you go talk to him. You say, you know what? Gates of hell will not prevail against the church. I'm going in. I'm going in. All you got to do is tell them that God loves them. All you got to do is tell them that God forgives them and he's not holding anything against them. He wants them in the kingdom of God. That's all you got to do. All you got to do is tell them that Jesus died on that cross for the sins of the world. And all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You don't have to, to get things in order here. The only thing you got to do is come to a place of repentance and acceptance of who Jesus is as Lord. We all can do that. But it's not done very much by the church. I'm talking about the church in general. Right? I've never met a soul winner, a true soul winner who said, I'm bored. Because boredom and, and truly serving God do not go together. You know who gets bored of Christianity? Carnal Christians. They still want to live like the world, think like the world, and act like the world. But let me slip in on a Sunday here and make an appearance. Our Christianity is too important and too precious for that. Don't you forget that, that our Christianity was built on passion and love because Jesus went to the cross for all of us. Amen? Besides, you're just still being tricked in your mind. Just being tricked by the devil. And some people say, well, if I, if I talk to someone about the Lord, I'm telling you, before this year's done, we're going to be the biggest soul winning church in the area because I'm not going to let go of it. I'm going to keep teaching it, preaching it. And they say, well, what, what, if, what if I tell them and they say no or they get mad at me? So that's, that's their problem. <laughs> Did Jesus say go into all the world to preach the gospel? He says those that will believe will be saved. And those that won't, won't, won't be, don't believe won't be saved. But your only job is to love them enough to tell them the truth. Amen. I mean, how, how much longer is the church going to watch this world get darker and darker and not stand up and say, here am I, Lord, send me. I, I, I'm, I'm reporting to duty. I'm in the army of God. Uh, uh, what, in, in the angel or somebody say, well, what's your station? I, I'm at Freedom of Christ Church, 4042 Sycamore Grove Road. Here I am reporting for duty. Lay some soul on my heart. Let me, let me minister to somebody. Let me pray for somebody. He'll give you that person. Amen. Amen. And even if that person doesn't come that you've prayed for, whoever it may be, go find somebody anyhow on your own. That's a good deal, right? You now I was talking about Brother Ronnie Cordell. That, that guy, he, that man was a soul winner. He... he he didn't have, like, you know, some people, like, when worked at the tree service, some people had a low gear. They, they wouldn't work very hard or very fast, but they just had one little gear. And I guess it was okay as long as they sped it up a little bit. Ronnie Cordell was stuck in high speed 24-7. He would get out of bed and be praising God, speaking in tongues, saying his confessions. He would go to the prisons in Baltimore those, those terrible prisons those, with all that terrible conditions, he'd walk right in there amongst them. And he'd say, hey, guys, how you doing? And he'd be giving them high fives and woo-hoo. I mean, he just was like true, true evangelist. But he had a heart for the lost. He'd go in those prisons, and sometimes 20, 30 people raised their hands for salvation. And then finally he said, I'm, start, I'm not counting anymore and I'm not giving any numbers anymore because I don't want to be bragging. I just want to go tell people about Jesus. If he did it, we all can do it. Amen. In fact, I think people are probably looking for that. I think they're, 
There's people that, you know, they, they just don't know the Lord, but yet they're not getting into all that ugly stuff. And, and, but they're looking for some kind of end to the things of God because they don't know anybody. And maybe they know that you're their neighbor and they see you going to church every Sunday morning. Maybe they're waiting for one day you'll just walk across the street and give them a card to the church and invite them. I don't know. I bet they are. Now, the Holy Spirit within your spirit will reveal your true identity, who you are in Christ. Now, don't turn there, but 1 Peter 3, 4, Peter talks about the hidden man of the heart or the spirit of the man or the spirit of the woman, the hidden man of the heart. So what you see out here is my flesh, the earth suit that I live in, but inside of me is the hidden man, the spiritual man, the born again man. Inside of me is where the kingdom of God lives. Amen. That's where the Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit. That's the part of us that God talks to. That's the part of us that gets stronger and grows in courage. That's the part of us that's greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. You got to believe that. Look at Romans 8. We're going to talk about now we're over here in this new covenant, how we have the spirit of God in us. And remember, as you're serving God, the Bible says God's word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. You're to follow the whole counsel of the word. What God's word says, you're to apply it and, and do it. And as you attempt to do what the word says, there's an anointing in that and the power of God to do exactly what you put your heart to do because God said to do it, right? Right? That's not just believing God for healing. That's a wonderful thing. That's just not believing God for a ministry or a gift or, or, or something. That's also being obedient. Being obedient to the word of God. Amen. That means you walk in love. Is walking in love a suggestion or a commandment? I believe it's a commandment. That means you forgive. Right? No matter how hard it is on you, you pray and you ask God, he'll give you the strength, his strength to forgive. So you can't just pick and choose what the word says. No, it's full surrender. It's like, God, I'm all in. And as you do and as you pray and fellowship with the Holy Spirit, you'll see this kingdom of God in you will, will, will start pushing out any negative thing that's in your mind or in your body. So look at Romans 8, 14. It says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. Of course, it always says sons, but it means sons and daughters of God. Amen. So are you a son, a daughter of God? That means you're led by the Spirit. Doesn't mean you always listen. Right? But you are to be led by by the Spirit of God inside of you. Look at verse 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Did you see that identity change in there and that name change? Before you met Jesus, you weren't a child of God. Now you are. And God's saying, you're not that anymore. Just like he said to Abram and Sarai, you're not that anymore. You're this. You're children of God. Better than that, you're my children. And I've given you my spirit. And he will lead you. And by the way, you haven't been given the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you've been given the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. That's, that's the blessing of God, isn't it? You've received the spirit of adoption. Whereby cry, we cry, Abba, Father. Man, that's, that's an identity change right there, isn't it? You've been adopted. You've been adopted into the family of God. When, when here, legally on earth, in, in, our, in the natural world, if you adopt a child, that child is legally yours. They get your name and everything. They're entitled to everything that even a, a biological child would be. Well, you are legally adopted into God's family. 
You know, you say, well, I don't feel like it. You know why? You concentrate on your old name. You concentrate on who you were before you met Christ. You concentrate on all your failures and all your weaknesses, and, and that's not what God says to do. You, you focus on him, know who you are, and he will help you through all those things. Right? God has no problem loving us all. That's one thing I have always known about God. Because I know there's a lot of people in the world. And I know there's a lot of important people in the world. I know there are all kinds of, of, of billions of people. But I also knew this, that God was with me too. His, his spirit was in me. I know that God knew my name. Because Jesus taught that. Didn't he? Do you know that? Do you know that God loves you so much? This is what Jesus taught the Jews. He taught the Jews first and then the Gentiles are in it. He said the Father loves you so much that every hair on your head is numbered. What more does he have to say? <laughs> every hair on your head is numbered. He, he loves you that much. Every detail about you. He knows what you're feeling and where your hurt is and where your pain is and where your struggle is. He knows it all. He just wants you to surrender to that love and say, you know what, God, you got me. I'm yours. You know, there's nothing more liberating and free to do that. Amen. I did that many years ago um, on my kitchen floor. Single parent with four children. And it felt like life kicked me in the gut. And it was a hard road. And one day I said, and you know what? I never blamed God one second. Because I know everything that happened to me, Satan's the thief. And, and I allowed him to steal from me and to destroy all kinds of things in my life. I allowed him. God didn't want that for me. But if you're going to get anything from God, you've got to stand up on your feet and know that you're a son of God and start getting it by faith. And if you walk out of your room, your, to take it figuratively, literally, not figuratively, if you walk out of your, your house every day and, and, and the Spirit of God says, go right and then take a left, and you go left and then take a right, and you fall in the same hole, don't blame God. Right? If God says the wages of sin is death, stay out of the, the sin. Amen? Stay out of those things. Look at verse 16. The Spirit, it's the capital S, right? Should be in your Bible. That's the Holy Spirit. Where's the Holy Spirit? He's in you. Where does he live? In your spirit. Right? Right? Now, I ask you, I'll just, does the Bible say God cleanses you from all sin, from all unrighteousness? You're a new creation. you got to be pretty, pretty clean for the Holy Spirit to live in you. And you know what? You are. You are. Now, you got a flesh and you got a soul that likes to get into stuff. That's why you got to conquer those things by the Spirit of God in you. Right? Look, the Spirit itself beareth witness or confirms and assures with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so meditation will bring revelation. So even a scripture like this, if you just read this over and over again, read it five, six, ten times, what's it matter? Read it. And it'll sink into you what is exactly saying is seeking into you now. But the more you press in, the more you're going to get. And it's going to hit you one day and say, oh, you're going to say, oh, my goodness. I am a child of God. I am. I was adopted. Abba, Father, the Holy Spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me and I have the ability to approach a holy God because my sins are forgiven and I'm cleansed and God is for me not against me it's going to just like come alive in you the longest 18 inches in the world is from here to here amen there's a whole lot of Christians they got a whole lot right here you know how you find out if you got it here let crunch time come 
Let the, let, let the crunch time come. And, and I want to say this to you. Nowhere in the Bible, when we face hardship, this is important because I teach this all the time, but people still get it wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that, that God won't give you more than you can handle. It doesn't say that. It says God will not allow the devil to put more on you than what you can handle, but with it he'll make a way of escape. Satan, we live in his world, and there's going to be trials and tests and tribulations, but God already promised you he can't overpower you. And with it, he'll make a way of escape. But if you're thinking, God's putting this on me. Okay, God, when's it? Uh, you, you must have gave it to me because you thought I could handle it. Your, your doctrine's wrong. Right? For someone to, to believe that, you got to show me. Show me three scriptures that tell me that. You can't even find one. Amen. Now, when, God, when you're following God, persecution comes for the word's sake, right? But it doesn't come from God. And, and so if you're on the, word of following, on the road of following God, you're going to go through struggles and things within yourself. But there's different roads. But the general things of this world that come to harm us all, that comes from the devil. Amen. Where's God going to get that from? Amen. And I'll just tell you the truth, honestly. Well, I always tell you the truth, but I'll tell you this truth. God, you ready for this one now? Will allow what you allow. Amen. Amen. He's given you all the power. He's given you all the authority. Now, he wants you to grow in faith and build a life of, 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 of power and victory. Doesn't, I'm not saying you're not going to have any storms and trials and tests and all these things along the way, but it's not God bringing it. Amen? And so you overcome them. And, and you might get down a little bit, and, and, and you might get uh, something come on your body here or that. Don't ever say it's from God and, and, and come against it every step of the way. And you get yourself healed up, and you get better, and you keep building your house, and you keep claiming the promises of God. You know, one of the great uh, faith teachers or teachers is, is Jesse DePlanis. Anybody ever hear him? <laughs> when he first started, you know, he's pretty fired up. He's like wired up pretty good. You can Google him, listen to his messages. But it'd be well worth it. He's, he's a good word of faith guy. Jesse DePlantis. And uh, um, so when he's born again, you know, just, just became a Christian. He's learning about the power of the name of Jesus. And, and we have authority over devils, Right. Right? We have all authority, Jesus said. In my name, what did he say you would do? Cast out devils. And he knew that. And so he's just a young Christian, and he's traveling, and, and he's learning. And in his hotel room one night, it was dark, and over in the corner, he saw this figure. And it spooked him a little bit. It was over in the corner. And uh, so he, he spent all night, he said, I was rebuking that thing. No devil, no devil, in the name of Jesus. And then when it, when it got light enough... He could see that it was a coat rack with the raincoat hanging on it. <laughs> so he was like a little kitten batting at a, a German shepherd, you know, like, you know, little kittens. I like to watch these little animal videos on Facebook. <laughs> you know, they're like swatting. Cats can be mean when they get older. And uh, so he was doing what he was supposed to do. Amen. That's all I'm saying. Do what you're supposed to do. Let God figure it all out. You know, there's people that believe God, that they, they believe God that they were going to go in the rapture and, and they have already gone by the way of the grave. How do you see those people? You know how I see those people? I see them as living a victorious life because they lived exactly how and doing what God said to do. Did they not? The Bible says... You live your life and you keep looking for the blessed appearing as if he could come tomorrow. And you keep, because the Bible says that's how you purify yourself. You're not going to be doing goofy stuff if you think Jesus could come tomorrow. Right? <laughs> it's how you keep it fresh. And so those people that have died and gone on to heaven, it wasn't a failure. It's never a failure to go to heaven. 
their time on earth, they did exactly what God said to do. And if you know anybody that died like that, you could know one thing. They lived a good, good life. Amen. They, that's how we're all supposed to live. And we don't know. We, I mean, I, I pray that we're that generation, but God could do whatever he wants to do. He could pull this out another 50 years. Or he could be here t- next year. But what, whatever he comes, whatever happens, just be found doing your father's business. And, and, and knowing who you are. And so look, but it gets better. Look at verse 16 again. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. Look at verse 17. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You, brothers and sisters, are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You're one spirit with him. That's how God changed your name, changed your identity, changed everything about you. You're a new creation in the inside. Now you just gotta um, meditate on it and enhance it and fellowship with the Holy Spirit within you and grow in that. Amen? I wonder what would have happened with Abraham and Sarah, when God said, because we read that, God said, you are no longer Abram. Did he not say that? And he said specifically, do not call Sarai, Sarai anymore. She is Sarah. I wonder what would have happened if they would have just ignored that and went about calling themselves their, their old names. God might have had to find another person. <laughs> Amen. Abraham believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. What would happen to you if you don't hook up with God? What if you could still call yourself, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace? Yeah, you were an old sinner saved by grace, but now you're a child of God. I don't like that song, so don't bring that song in here. There's a song that says, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. No, you're more than that. Yeah. We all know we're all were sinners of, of the devil, right? But now... I'm a child of God, not only a child, I'm an heir, and not only an heir, I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I I only got three minutes, but I preach myself happy. That's who I am. Everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to me. Everything. When someone gives you their name, and they say, look, Wherever you go, you tell them that I sent you and you go in my name. That's a big deal. That's what he did for us. He said, in my name, go in my name. He's one with us. If someone persecutes this church, they're persecuting Jesus. Isn't that what what Jesus said to um, Saul? He changed Saul's name to what, Paul? But when Saul was, uh, was persecuting the church and he was on the road of Damascus, and, and the bright light came, and he fell off of his donkey. And, and, he, and, and the Lord says this, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? Me. He was persecuting the church, and Jesus said, if you persecute the church, you're persecuting me. I'll be on Team Jesus any day, because that is the winning team. Amen. You know, there's the, the, the real like liberal type a part of society. I mean, they're, they're putting pressure on people. They tell these big businesses, you better you either go woke or you'll go broke. Most of these businesses that do all these crazy things, they don't really believe that, but they're being pressured and threatened into that. We'll cut off your money. We'll blackball you. You'll go broke. Well, I want to tell them if you go woke. You'll go broke in the spirit. The Bible says that a, that, a, um, that a strong spirit in a man or a woman can sustain them in time of trouble. But a wounded spirit, who can bear? I'm not bankrupting myself, anything. I'm woke to Jesus, but hey, that's what I want to be woke to. Look at Psalms 107 too. 
And this is the last scripture. And so will you let God change your name? Will you start digging into the scripture and finding all that God says about you and declare that over yourself? Even when you're not feeling well, and it seems like sickness is trying to get in your body, it doesn't change the fact that who you are in Christ, you are well and you are healed and you are delivered, and that's what you say. Amen? That's who God made you to be. And you keep speaking like that, and that power of God will push that stuff out of your life. But you gotta, you gotta um, have a resolve. A lot, a lot of Christians, they, they, they get fired up, but then there's no, the, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. There was a good uh, boxer by the name of Mike Tyson. Anybody remember him? He bit another boxer's ear, tore a big chunk off. Anyway, he said, everybody has a fight plan until they get hit in the mouth. Every boxer, you know, um, look like a million bucks hitting a boxing bag, you know, punching bag and, and shuffling their feet around the gym and, and around the ring. And then they get out there and he punches them in the face and the, there goes the game plan. That's how a lot of Christians are. I'm telling you right now, you're going to get hit in the face. Hope it didn't burst your faith bubble. You live in a fallen planet, but you know what? Don't you go down. If you go down, you get back up, and you come at the devil, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The Bible says that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. You speak the name above all names. Amen? That's the knockout blow. Psalms 107.2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Are you the redeemed? Then say so. Right? What are you redeemed from the hand of the enemy? What's the hand mean? Power. Amen. The hand, the hand, the hand of God is like the power of God over you. You're redeemed from the power of Satan over you. And so let the redeemed say so. I believe it means say it all the time. Because you're saying something anyway, you might as well say that. Right? So, your, your name changed. I am a new creation, created in Christ Jesus. I am healed. I am delivered. I am a man or, or a woman of peace. I am wise. I am joyful. I am full of faith and courage. I am love because God is love. That's who you are. If you, if you have a problem, trouble with temper, don't go around saying, I, I got a temper problem, or I get angry. What, what, are you, what are you calling yourself that for? Right? Is that who you want to be? Because that's not who God made you to be. Do you struggle with that? Yeah. But is that who you are? No. In Christ, you are more than that. And I want to tell you something, too. It's not the emotions that come or the feelings that comes that's the problem now either. Because the Bible does say, be angry and sin not. You're not going to be a robot where you're immune to any kind of feelings. They're going to come, but how you handle and deal with those emotions is, is everything. Okay? So when an emotion of anger comes, take a minute and just get yourself together and say, no, I, I'm not going to be angry. I'm going to walk in the love of God because the love of God is in me. The Bible says be quick to listen, right? Slow to speak. See, some of you talk, too, talk first and then don't listen. Not you, people in there, right? Be quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to get angry. I know some people, before they got saved, they would fight you at a drop of a hat. They say, what'd you say about me? No, just keep that fire and keep that fervor but in the right way. Fight the fight of faith. No person on this earth or on this planet is your enemy. Satan is the only enemy you got. Amen? And so, in closing, I just want to say this. The Lord put this in my heart. It's, it says this. We've all been hurt by someone in our lives. At least I know I have. It can be very painful, but thankfully God can heal our wounds when God, when God heals us of our wounds, people will see us as someone who God touched. 
I would much rather be known as the person who God touched than the person who got hurt by someone. I don't agree with the statement that time heals all wounds either. Only God can heal all wounds. And so you got a choice. When life hits you hard, people hurt you or you're hurt by certain situations, you can go around and be known. People will see you as the person who got hurt. I got tired of that. I decided I wanted to be the person that when people look at me, they see a person that God touched. Amen. He touched me. My life isn't defined by the past pains and hurts. It's not, it doesn't define me. What defines me is who I am in Christ and what God does for me. That, that's liberating. That'll set you free. That's all I have. Would you rise, please? Thank you for coming out. Let's pray. Father, we come to the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for this message that you brought into my heart. Lord, I thank you, Father God, that it, that it was powerful and effective. And Lord, I just thank you for these precious souls. Lord, may they go out of here in power and glory and, and glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen.